Good. It does look like it's going to, to work right now. Awesome. And so the next, the next reaction is a very important one, but you do not need to know its mechanism. This is the first one that I think I've talked about that you do not need to know the mechanism, but you just need to know the, um, like the reaction conditions, like what you'd start with and what you'd end up with one way or the other, because it's going to be one that we use over and over again. And it's called the hydrogen, hydrogenation of alkenes. Okay, so this is hydrogenation of alkenes. So what do you suppose is being added to the alkene here? I'm just giving it its name. Hydrogen. Okay, so not, not a biggie. And so what we're working here with is elemental hydrogen. And what does elemental hydrogen look like? It's H2. And so that's one of the reaction conditions. So we're going to start with an alkene. It requires H2, and it does require a catalyst. And the catalysts here are specific metals. Usually, we're talking about platinum. That's the, the big one that probably gets used the most. Palladium which is, whoops, PD, nickel can be used, and then the one that people oftentimes forget, but it's rhodium, which is RH. One of those, and I mean, it's a metal, it's the metal catalyst, it's not the anion, uh, the cation, I'm sorry, but we're talking about metal. <clears throat> so if you add hydrogens to alkenes, what's going to be the product? is an alkane. This is one way that we have to go from an alkane to an alkene. We don't have a way to go directly from an alkane. I'm sorry. This is one way we have to go from an alkene to an alkane. We don't have a way to go backwards directly. You're going to find out that you can do things. We can halogenate the alkane to make an alkyl halide and then turn the alkyl halide into an alkene. But there's not a quick way to do this. But this is one way that we have to go from an alkene to an alkane. And so, your book, I would attempt to draw it. It draws out the proposed mechanism. And since the people in the video can't see me, but I just did the air quotes. So, because it's really hokey. And so I can't, I can't draw it and give it justice, but I, I will attempt to draw parts of it. Um, the whole idea is you literally have an electrode here. So you put platinum or palladium, nickel or rhodium metal... So this, would, for example, can be platinum. And hydrogens get stuck to it. So they're like hanging off this, this electrode. And then you have your alkene. I'm going to actually draw a cycloalkene just because that way it's easier to see stereochemistry. And that's very important because hydrogenation will always give you one stereotype. And so, um, stereotype, well, it is a stereotype, one stereoisomer. <clears throat> and we, so that's our alkene. This is just an example alkene. But what happens here, and this is where I can't, can't draw it very well, is that you get pi bond, the pi bond of the alkene. Because remember, that's a pi bond and a sig sigma bond. But the pi bonds, which look like the dumbbells, they interact with the hydrogen, and so one of the hydrogens will actually pop up and will, will form on the, the carbon of the, one of the carbons of the double bond. <clears throat> so then it's kind of holding it in place. As it holds it in place on this, it doesn't leave the metal. So it's held in place in order for the double bond to then go and attack another hydrogen. But since that alkene is held in place here, both of the hydrogens get added to the same side. Okay, so because of this, you always get what's called a cis addition. And that's the important thing. You always will get cis addition. Which, what did cis mean? Same. same. And so once again, this is just, it's being added. The two hydrogens get added to the same side of the bond. So therefore, you're always going to have a cis addition. And that's really important in the sense that later on, they introduced it in this chapter, but it's not until I think it's chapter 7 or 8, where we do stereochemistry, and we can actually change the stereo or alter the stereochemistry because both of the hydrogens now would get added. So we're going to end up with 
I'm going to attempt to draw it here. <clears throat> Both of the hydrogens added. So these would be the two hydrogens added. Of course, there were already hydrogens that were on it, but they would be going the other direction. So in the lighter color were the original hydrogens, and the darker color were the two added. But it's one way we now have to go from an alkene to an alkane. You do not need to know the mechanism. The book does show like how the orbitals overlap, and so the electrons can do, do the attacking and things. Okay. Um, all right. So the opposite of um, of cis, or it's also called sin addition, the opposite would be called anti, and that's important for later on, but we're not going to be doing um, anti at this point. So the next mechanism I want you to know, you do them, and it's actually quite simple, and you're going to see this same mechanism used over and over and over again with the alkenes. And so I'm just going to show one example, but then you could use... I'm going to show it with a, with a hydrogen halide, so something like hydrochloric or hydrobromic acid, but you can actually use other acids like sulfuric, phosphoric, nitric, things like that. And so what I'm talking about here is this is electrophilic addition to alkenes. So we're talking about electrophilic... addition to alkenes. I want you to know the actual mechanism, but the overall is we're going to start with, whoops, that's the wrong one. We're going to start with an alkene, and here I'm going to use an acid, like HX, but you could, you could use, H, for example, H2SO4. Instead of looking like HX, if you use sulfuric acid, it's going to look like this, HOSO3H. Because it's an oxygen that's going to be added on. Well, it's, this group is also going to be added on. One side gets the H, the other side gets this OSO3H. And then our products here... Is, is no longer going to be an alkene, but it's going to be... If you start off with HX, you're going to end up with an alkyl halide. Okay, so X, H, and then, of course, what are the two other things that were hanging off? <clears throat> now, here, typically, the reaction conditions are going to be lower temperatures. Of course, that's relative speaking. But you also have to use specific types of solvents. You cannot use water. You do not want to use alcohol. And so the solvents that typically are used, I didn't leave much room. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write them in a different color so that way they stick out. So the solvents that typically are going to be used are things like pentane, chloroform, Benzene, so these are all nonpolar solvents or relatively nonpolar solvents. And then the one that doesn't make as much sense is acetic acid sometimes can be used because that's a very weak acid. But once again, those are just the reaction conditions. <clears throat> So I'm going to move this on up, so that way we can actually write out, whoops, write out the mechanism. The first step of this mechanism is if we remember we have an acid here, what's the rule of thumb with respect to acids? Protonate. So let's just draw a generic alkene. And I have, I'm just going to call it HX for the generic acid. And one of the reasons why you don't want this in water is because it's water that would then be, could possibly be added, or the water would also be what's protonated. <clears throat> okay. 
So what do we have around that's electron rich that can be protonated? Always before we protonated the alcohol and it was the oxygen of alcohol, what do we have that's electron rich here that can be protonated? And so, well, one thing is, so it has to have, so which of these are, are the two, which of the two of these is going to be the acid itself? The HX. The HX. And so what's going to be electron rich that could, could receive the hydrogen that would be protonated? The double bond. And so what's going to happen here, I'll do it in a separate color, is, and you're going to find out it may matter which side does the attacking, but right now we're going to assume that these two carbons are equal that there's not a difference between what's hanging off of them. So I like to draw it as like a little lever, but it's going to swing out and bang into that hydrogen. Of course, something has to leave, and that what leaves is the halogen, and it's going to take those two electrons, because that's what protonation does, is the two electrons stays with the X. This is the slow step, and just as a general rule of thumb is almost always when you form a carbocation, that's going to be the slow step. Okay, so it's actually not going to be very favorable to go forward. But this is a slow or the rate limiting step. And so the way I have it drawn here, there's the H. We have an X minus. And we also have a carbocation. Okay. So, what do you suppose is going to be happening now for step two? The X minus does the attacking. Boom. And this is very fast. Okay. And irreversible, essentially. So, this is the fast step. And so, now we're left with an alkyl halide. So, if we started off with Um, an alkene, we can actually now make it into an alkyl halide, which is important because as we've seen, as we discussed earlier, like iodine, for example, is also a good leaving group later on. So one way that we have to activate um, uh, compounds, we can activate an alkane by doing free radical halogenation. We can also turn an alkene now into an alkyl halide. <clears throat> okay. And the last point that I wanted to make, and I want you to know that mechanism, it's relatively simple, but um, the last point I wanted to make with this is called regioselectivity. Which we've kind of, we've actually already discussed regioselectivity. Oops, hit the wrong one. What does that mean? Right. It's going, is, no, is it going to be favorable? As I mentioned, we assumed in that first example that the two carbons were identical. But what happens if they're not? Like, what happens if one of them's got two carbons hanging off of it and the other one's got two hydrogens? Now it's asymmetrical. And so it could be then, and it is, that one way is going to be better than the other. And that's due to the regioselectivity. Technically, in I with no offense to this poor man, but I always just call him Mark. But his name is Markovnikov. But it's called Markovnikov's Rule. Let me spell Markovnikov first. And then I call him good old Mark after this. Markovnikov. Markovnikov's. Uh, where is the... There it is. Um, rule. There's Markovnikov's Rule, and there's one called Zaitsev's Rule. But... They're very, very similar to each other. And that's, that's that if HX is being added to an unsymmetrical alkene, okay, the hydrogen is going to be added to one carbon more favorably than the other. And so what I'm saying in the example here is what if it looked like this? And we were using HX. Oh, whoops, I was using that with a different color. HX. There are two possibilities. The hydrogen could either be added to the carbon that already had a hyd hydr the, the higher number of hydrogens on there, 
or the hydrogen can be added to the carbon that is already highly substituted. And Markovnikov's rule is the one that tells you which one it is. So which do you think is probably going to get the hydrogen? The one, the carbon on the left that has the higher number of hydrogens already, or the carbon on the right that has the higher number of carbons? It's the one on the left. And the reason being is when this swings out, so if this carbon keeps the electrons and it swings out, then this carbon, the highly substituted carbon, is going to be the carbocation and it's more stable. If it goes the other way, the carbon that two hydrogens would be the carbocation and that's not very stable. Remember, the more friends it has, the more stable it is. And so what Markovnikov's rule states is that the hydrogen will be added to the carbon with the most hydrogens already on it. <clears throat> and that's because the other carbon, the more substituted carbon, will make the more stable carbocation. And if I were you, make sure you can work out that mechanism because you're going to see it over and over again. Okay? And so at this point, we're going to stop, and we're going to actually learn how to form alcohols from an alkene. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's very, 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 very similar to what we've just seen. So 